All right. Let me get situated here. How's everybody doing today? Sounds good. Although Canada did bring some cold. Definitely will not hold it against you. <laughs> I was saying I always procrastinate on uh, putting my coat on until after my birthday because I, like, I live in Missouri now. So it's like mm, absolutely not until like middle November will I put on my coat. I heard some North Dakota laughter. Is there some North Dakota? Yep, over there. South Dakota, North Dakota, Canada. We're all kind of there. All right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray. as I get my water bottle open. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Jesus, we've come to meet you again. Oh, Jesus, we love you. We worship you. There's nobody like you anywhere. As much as people search for something else to fulfill a void, You are the only thing that can be found to fill that void. I thank you, Jesus, that you are that thing. You are that peace. You are that comfort. The magnitude of your love is unmeasurable. Jesus, we love you. We love you. We love you. We love you, too. We worship you. There's nobody like you. I just ask you to breathe on this message. I ask you to fan the flames of our heart, Jesus. I ask you to bring us closer together as a family. And I thank you, Jesus, for giving us purpose. May we fall more and more and more in love with you the more that we hear about you, the more that we learn about you, the more that we think about you causes us to go deeper. So, Jesus, I thank you that I see like a rope that's tied around our church, and every time that we say his name, he pulls us deeper, and he pulls us deeper, and he pulls us deeper. And I thank you, Jesus, that you are so faithful that when we look in your direction, you pull us deeper. Jesus, I thank you. I just think of the worship song, I want more, I want more. And I thank you, Jesus, that that you gave us your fullness. And that more that we're searching for is just an access. I just keep getting that. Like, I gave you my fullness, now access it. But I thank you, Jesus, that that access is there. Oh, you're so beautiful. Altogether lovely. We worship you, Jesus. Goodness, I'm just feeling like all kind of lovesick right now. I just want to stay in that atmosphere. Beautiful, beautiful worship. I love it. Thank you, worship team. It was like the atmosphere in here was electric. Like, it was like, I had this thought uh, when we were, um, it's in that song, His Goodness is Running After Me. Um, and then I had a thought that um, if His goodness is always running after me, um, like what happens if I'm standing still? <laughs> so I just like I just had a like a nice laugh, and as I was thinking that thought, I just got hit with his goodness, and it was like that's what it is. Like you want to you want to position yourself because that goodness it says it's always running after you. So like sometimes we're running away from it and zigzagging because we want to like feel in our feelings and and be that way, and then just get that picture if goodness is running after you. What if you stopped and turned around and just got hit with the goodness? You you have to allow yourself to stop and be run over by that goodness. And if you're stationary and that and something's running, you're you're, they're not going to hit you and fall off. It's going to plow straight through you. So sometimes, like during worship, we just need that. We just need to stop, stop thinking, stop, stop. Just stop everything. I don't know how to explain it, but just be with him. Let that goodness run over you. He'll love it. I was like, I couldn't quit crying over here. And then um, in one of the worship songs, it says that he sits on the mercy seat. And um, that just made me like cry even more because praise God, he's sitting on that mercy seat, that he has that mercy for us. And that, that that mercy is new every single morning. And 
I was just getting some deep revelations on his mercy and how merciful he is to me. And then as I'm thinking about all the ways he's merciful to me, I start thinking about like some of the things that I've like done bad in my life or whatever. And like, cause that's where I view the areas that he gives me mercy. And then, um, good, good father was coming on as I'm like just swimming in these thoughts with God. And I start to trail off. And then I hear, um, you tell me you're pleased and that I'm never alone. It was just like, God was just giving me a whole message like right there in like a matter of like 10 minutes of worship because I'm I'm thinking about his mercy and then I started to think about things that I've done wrong and how he's given me mercy in this situation and then all of a sudden he was like I'm pleased with you and you're never alone and then I was just like what if we could go to sleep every night thinking that same exact phrase you are pleased with me and I will never be alone how much would that change our how much would that renew our minds if every night we committed to fully believe that you are pleased with me and I'll never be alone because I can never be separate from God. Even if I'm living in sin, where is he? He's hip to hip with me. He didn't go anywhere. And just because I think like I don't want to acknowledge him because I'm in sin, so I turn away from him, he's not gone anywhere. And that's what I was telling um, some of the kids at youth where if, if you're sitting next to somebody like Azzy and Jack, like they're sitting next to each other, but if they don't talk to each other, they don't look at each other, they feel completely separate from each other. And that's the way that we get sometimes with God when we're living in sin, where we just refuse to acknowledge him. But trust me, he's right there. And, and he's, when he's looking at you during this time, he has that mercy and he doesn't see your sin. He just wants your attention. Because if your attention is to him, it can't be on what you are currently doing. You can't be actively living in sin if you're face-to-face with the one who is. It's just not possible. And then if you keep turning away from him into sin, it just means that you like it. You like being in there. You like feeling hopeless. You like feeling desperate. You like feeling alone. Trust me, nobody likes feeling that way. It's a deceit. It's a lie from the devil. He just causes mischief. He steals, kills, and destroys. That's what I'm not, not even close to what I was going to talk about today, but it's I just feel it where it's just like he is so pleased with you because a lot of people think that God's this guy upstairs who's mad at him and all this stuff, but he's not. He's a guy that's just like, look at me, love me, be with me. I made you to be with me. Why aren't you being with me? Thirty seconds later, you're still not being with me. Like he's his goodness is always running after you. It's always pursuing you relentlessly. And all we need to do is stop and turn around. And it reminds me of a vision that I've had that I've probably shared. But um, I remember looking in a mirror, and um, when I was a kid, I'd run away in, in the grocery or the shopping center, and they always have those three way mirrors. And that's where my mom knew to find me because I would always be like. Phew. Just like uh, Jim Carrey was like my favorite actor, so I was always overacting everything, and and I always wanted to be like an actor or used to. And then I got a vision of God showing me how I was so focused on myself, and that's like the state of the world now, where we're just so focused on like selfies and how we look and our image and and what people think. But really, so like we're in in, in a metaphor of life, we're looking in the mirror at ourselves, and realistically, God's behind us with his arms open like this, just waiting for us to stop looking at ourselves, to look past ourselves and see that he's always been right there behind us. And then what do we do? We renew our mind. We turn around, we repent, and we face him. He says, I'm right here. And his hands are out. All you got to do is put yours out, and you'll get the biggest hug you've ever had in your life. And that's when many times when people except Jesus, you just hear like some of the same things and some of the same things I was saying, he's real, he's real, he's real. Because that hug, that kiss is real. And it can't be pushed off. It can't be explained away because it's so real. And that's the first time that when somebody's ushered into a relationship with Jesus where they acknowledge that he is who he says he is, or he is who he is, it's just undeniable. It's unmistakable. And that's my God. That's my Jesus. Okay. <laughs> I, um, 
I am dressed a little different today. <laughs> For the people only listening online, normally I'm wearing shorts, a t-shirt, and a, a hat with some shoes. And my uh, my anniversary is on Monday. And I've been married to my beautiful wife, Cindy, for eight years. First couple were tough, but boy, I got to say, we're swimming now. <laughs> I wouldn't, yeah, I'm, she told me not to do it. I won't. I love you, Cindy. I know you're going to be listening to this next week. Um, so we went out to eat, and she said to me, she was like, why don't you dress up like you used to dress up? And um, before, when I would go, um preaching at church to church and town to town. Um, there was these shirts like these, and they were called Robert Graham shirts, and they're, like, stupid expensive. Like, some of them are, like, $1 to $400, and, they're, and I could tell you all about them. They're just, like, they're, they're made in Italy. They got silk stitching here, and everything's individual and all that stuff. They're worth the quality. And when I was a stay-at-home dad, and I first started preaching, I couldn't afford a Robert Graham shirt, like, at all. And some of my favorite preachers, like Todd White and Daniel Kalinda, they all they were all wearing Robert Graham shirts. So in my head, I was like, when I get a Robert Graham shirt, I'll be, a, like, I'll know I've made it. And uh, I just started, like, and I knew I couldn't afford one, like, at all. Um, and then when I was a stay-at-home dad, I started you know, selling watches. And these were the t-shirts that I started selling because I would find a cheap one and then I would sell that one for double and then buy a nicer one and so on and so forth. And throughout a matter of a year, I've acquired, like, I think I just looked in my closet and I have like 25 Robert Graham shirts. So I have like 25 of these ugly shirts. (laughs) And I used to think that they were like, actually, I really don't think they're ugly. They're just wild. And this is, I was telling Nathan, like, this is the tamest one that I have where the the collars are different than than this. And it turns out my wife really liked that, and I didn't know that. I thought she was just, like, supporting me, and, okay, Jesse wants to wear a goofy shirt or whatever. And um, and it got to be to the point to where, um, you know, I'd, I'd have several nice shoes, I'd have the brand new jeans and the shirt, and then I would... I would, like, I would feel ready to preach. And I was just like, I'm ready to give God's word now. And... Um, God really humbled my heart like big time where he was just like, what if it was just shorts and a ball cap and um, people couldn't, because you know, like when people looked at me, um, I would, I'd always used to have like a big self self worth thing because you know, I got, I don't like really look the part of somebody that's polished and I'm actually not even polished, but it's like the beard and the hair and all that kind of stuff. I didn't want people to make their own assumptions about me before I even started giving a message. So I was like, okay, I have to look the part. If I'm going to be an evangelist and I'm going to go to church to church, I should have, you know, six nice shirts and all this kind of stuff. And how backwards is that? Like, I don't preach any more fire because I'm wearing a hundred and something dollar shirt. And I've actually never paid more than $50 for one of these shirts. So nobody get the wrong idea. <laughs> But my wife asked me to wear it, and she was like, you should start dressing up uh, when you uh, preach. And I was like, as you wish. Princess Bride did it. That's all you got to say. As you wish. A happy wife, happy life. And she's always happy because she married me. So I don't have to work too hard because... I did trick her into thinking I was a cool guy, so our relationship was based on lies and manipulation, but... Praise God, huh? Wow. <laughs> Eight years. Still got her. <laughs> okay. I am going to preach out of Hebrews, and this will be a little bit of a different message than I normally give. Um, normally, I just give a little bit of Scripture, and I, I go off of my experience of that Scripture, and I'll do a little bit of that today. But I went through uh, quite the trial in the last two weeks to where for the first time in my life, I thought that there was going to be no more Jesse because <laughs> I started to get uh, some chest pains and then all of a sudden my lungs started to really hurt like right back here. So he was like, how can you tell they're your lungs? And I'm just like, I don't know. My kidneys are here. My lungs are here. Like, I don't, I think I know where stuff in my body's at. And being like a, uh, a good old boy, and I wouldn't say I am a good old boy by any means, but um, I kind of just ignored him, you know? I was just like, Ugh. okay, that went away. Praise God, we're still good. Now I'm healthy. <laughs> we're good. 
Um, and then it just kept coming and then it kept coming and it kept coming. And then I started to tell my wife about it and she was like, I don't know. She's like, that sounds kind of serious. And I'm like, nah, it's probably fine. And then like, it really started to hurt. And then, um, like for the first time in my life, I like felt like truly like the fear of death in my life. Like, and I've never felt, I mean, yeah, sure. You're standing on a ledge. You're about to go cliff diving or something like that. Like maybe the fear of death light might come through, but like you consciously made that decision to jump off the cliff. So I don't know how much fear should be there, but I have like never really dealt with anxiety I've never been like a super anxious person um, because like when I'm anxious, I can't do anything about it. Like, you, like you have to, you have to, tr you know, trust God and let him do. And I've only had anxiety situations that weren't super major, you know, like, oh yeah, maybe if we don't pay this bill, we got to get some money together. You know, God always fulfills that. Like how much anxiety should you have in that? And if it, and if it doesn't, go through then maybe you shouldn't be in that house or whatever you know i'm yes lord i'm here this is your plan i said yes so send me and i didn't say but where and what are the stipulations if i said yes send me i'm going to be obedient but this fear and anxiety had to do with my life like my living breathing life my flesh that i hold on to so dear um and even deeper than that, what was really scaring me was I wasn't necessarily worried about me. I was worried about my six kids and my wife, my stay-at-home wife, and I'm the provider for the family, right? Do you hear what I said? I'm the provider. How wrong is that? I'm not, I'm not a provider for my wife. The Lord is my provider for my wife. And for me to get scared and be like, how are they going to, uh, like, okay, if I, like, I was just going through all these things in my head and making plans, like, if, like, even just to say this out loud just feels really bad to say, but I'm a very transparent guy. It's like, what you see is what you get, and I'll tell you exactly how I was feeling, even though when I preach the messages, living them is a, is a different thing, but walking them out continually and saying, yes, Lord, but it was just like, what if I get cancer? Okay, um, my house is worth more money. I'll, I'll sell it. We'll go back to South Dakota where the family is closer to Minnesota. Maybe I have four months. And it's just like all these, just like all these st absolutely stupid things. And, um, and I called on like my brothers and everything and, um, they're really encouraging me. And it got to the point to where actually before I called on my brothers, I went to the emergency room. And they hooked me up to the EKG, they took my blood, they took uh, just x-rays of my chest, like they did like everything they could in the ER, and they EKG was fine, blood work was fine, chest x-rays were fine, and they were like, we don't know what to tell you, bud, you're not dying, so <laughs> I was just like, in my head, I'm like, whoo, praise God, even though you didn't tell me what was going on, you said I'm not dying, don't take it, you can't take it back. <laughs> doctor said I'm not dying so now I feel better and then realistically it took that guy to tell me that I wasn't dying for me to ultimately have some peace in my life and I was like disgusted with myself that that doctor praise God for the doctor and medicine and all that kind of stuff I love them they're there um but I realized this the, the state of my heart that I had peace once this man told me that I wasn't going to die <sighs> God was pulling me into a deeper revelation of the way I view myself, you know? I wanted to be okay because I know that he is going to take care of everything if my physical body is no more. God, I give you, you know, God, I give you my kids. They're yours. Just like how that sermon I preached where you have to give them all the rooms in the house. God was revealing some rooms that I haven't yet given to him. Because if he is to be the protector, and if I'm supposed to give him the keys, and if we're supposed to be childlike to where he's the dad, and he pays the bills, and he protects, then this situation shouldn't have bothered me. So I love how God is helping me in a situation to renew my mind and to say, oh, this is an area. Okay, I give it to you. And then even deeper than that, God was saying, well, what is this? 
because I was, you know, I've, like I've said, I've never felt anxiety and I've never had what some would probably call a panic attack. And I feel like um, I was going through these things so that I can relate to people who have been or who are actively going through these things. And I'm talking like three weeks of this stuff too. And I know, I remember when I first started praying for people and their, their bodies would hurt or, you know, I'd be going and my back would hurt and I'd be like, is anybody back hurt? Like right here. Yeah. Me. And then I'd pray for him. And then I asked the Lord never to do that to me again, because you don't have to make me physically hurt to pray for somebody. Just tell me, <laughs> like, just say there's a back here that hurts on the left side. Okay. Is anybody back? I'll stand up and I'll say it, God. You don't have to, you don't have to sing me, zing me in there. But I, for the first time in my life, I, I know what it's like to have that tunnel vision, that, that room closing in, that anxiety, that fear, that I've never felt before because it's not mine and I don't own it and it's not of me. But I felt like I was going to physically, like me and Greg were talking about it, but it was just like, just kill me. I'm dead. Like, I don't know what else to do. Like, you're, I'm either going to pass out or I'm going to die. And I didn't either. <laughs> so I was still feeling in this anxiety and this tunnel vision and this closing in. And then um, what do you do when you're going through these battles, right? You get on your knees and you worship him, right? That's what I did. I got on my knees and I worshiped him and I turned on some worship music. And then the devil was still just hammering down. And um, there was one of my favorite worship songs that came in. And then I had a vision of uh, my kids crying at my funeral. And that said, this is what they're going to play at your funeral. It's like, as I'm trying to ward away this anxiety and this fear and this tunnel vision, what am I going to do? I'm going to worship Jesus. And as I'm trying to worship Jesus, I just keep getting bombarded by the enemy. And you know, what kind of flowers are going to be there? You think they're going to cream at you? Won't your daughters be sad? No. Jesus, I worship you. I love you. And it's like, oh, do you? And then um, I was like, okay, that's not, that's not working. I was like, I'm going to read. And I, pu I pulled out my Bible, and I started pacing my room. like I, That's how I like always read. And I, I go back and forth, and I could not read the words in my Bible. Like, they, they weren't clear to me. Like, I would, I would look at them, and, like, the verse would go up one or it would go down one, and I, I, like, I could not focus. And then I, like, stopped, and I went like this, and then I just heard this thing. It says, no matter how hard you try, you'll never get it straight. And it was just like, I was just getting directly attacked, like big time. And the only thing that helped was I laid face down on the ground and I just started praying in tongues. And I said, I'm going to lay here until it's gone, until it's done. Turns out that it only took five minutes. <laughs> Like when you don't know what to do, get on your face, <laughs> speak to him. And if you don't know what to say, the Holy Spirit will pray on your behalf. Start belting out them tongues. Just get it. And if you haven't <laughs> spoken in tongues before, that's a good spot to try. <laughs> amen and amen. <laughs> Nate was like, Bow, 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 bow. Okay, that's not what I was going to preach out at all. I just feel like that's like what the Lord was really like laying on my heart to um, share with you guys. Because even though like Rod and Nate and whoever, even the worship team, like everybody, even though we stand up here, we're no different than anybody else in this world. And just because I preach about all five rooms doesn't like that stuff I'm, I'm, I'm actively getting victory on in my life. And when I, I preach about that kind of stuff, the devil just says, okay, here's an opportunity. So like when you're, when you're talking to somebody and you're ministering to them, you can only like, I always say you can only replicate what you are. So if you're a drug addict I don't necessarily think you should be ministering to drug addicts unless you've, I, okay. I have not found victory in that atmosphere unless I've had victory over it first. So when you're ministering to people, just be really mindful and, and flow with what 
God is telling you to say, not from your experience and what you think that you know about that person or what you can say. I feel like I should start dancing or something. <laughs> Will you dance with me, Lord? Anybody ever danced with God? David did. All right, so anyways, I'm going to try to get through as much of this as I can. Um, Hebrews 11 um, when I was going through all of this, um, like I said probably last time that I used to read Hebrews, like, and if you guys can and you have that time, you guys should try to read Hebrews. Like, just make it a point to read it like three times in one week. I think it's only like 13 chapters, and it's, for me, just so rich and full of revelation. So I'm going to start um, with Hebrews 11, and a little fun fact, depending on on what you have, like NLT, uh, King James or whatever, um, Hebrews 11 says the word faith almost, tw- I think, 25 times, and then it uses the word faithful once. So there's a little bit of a pattern going on through here. So I'm just going to... I'm going to read it. I'm going to read it piece by piece. Um, And I don't know if that frustrates anybody, but that's just the way that I can kind of like break down scripture. And I'm trying to give you guys some practical insight to where when I'm reading the Bible, um, these are some of the things that I'm thinking. These are some of the things that God's telling me as I'm reading this. And um, Hebrews is really good because they, Hebrews 11 is really good because they, they bring up a bunch of different examples of faith. So I'm just going to go ahead and let her rip. All right, Hebrews 11.1. 1. Faith is the confidence that what we hope for will actually happen. It gives us assurance about things that we cannot see. Okay, so this is directly ties into worship here and what I was feeling. Um, because for our youth, for the past month or so, like I've said, we've we've been worshiping in here and we've been praying in here in this sanctuary and we've been cultivating an atmosphere to where when you guys come in here on Sunday, what happened today happens every time. So I don't know about you guys, but worship was electric for me. I just felt like there was this atmosphere where it was heightened and that I felt overwhelmed. I just, I, it was a thickness, I guess, a thickness of his presence. And, and that's what, when we're declaring and as a youth and as when we get together, we say we are worshiping in here to cultivate an atmosphere for our, our church members to come in and easily receive from God. Cause we want it so thick in here that when they walk in, it's different. They feel his presence. And that is faith is a confidence and that that what we hope for will actually happen. It gives us assurance about things that are unseen. Even though you can't see it, I'm God's showing it to me like in my spirit. All right. Through their faith, the people in the days of old earned a good reputation. And that got me to think, um, how good is your reputation with God? Like throughout your, your walking with him, and the things that he's telling you to do, um, how good is your reputation with God? And that's something like, just like jot it down in your notes and go home and talk to God about that because he can start to reveal some areas in your life where he is so, so, so pleased with you that you had no idea that you were doing it right. You know, he's good at coming along and affirming you in that atmosphere. And there could be, you know, almost always with me, there is areas of opportunity where there's room for improvement. Okay, it is by faith, uh, number three, by faith we understand that the entire universe was formed at God's command and that what we see did not come from anything that can be seen. And I have, boom, science, you're wrong in my Bible right there. That was a very young me right there, I love it. But it's just like when people are are talking about like the creation of earth and all this kind of stuff, like anything that you see right now is created from something that can't be seen. Like God, like, can you, can you breathe life? Can you see that air? Like, and, and I like to swim on that too, because just on these three verses, um, I could swim all day on them and say, 
you know, is by faith that we understand. So God, I have faith that, that when you, the way you said you made the world is the way that you made the world. And I'm not going to listen, listen to the world on the way that they think that it was made. I'm going to go straight to the creator. How? Oh, okay. That what we now see did not come from anything that can be seen. Perfect. Thanks for clearing that up. That, that was weird. That worked. Okay, number four. And this is where we'll do some some hopping around in the scriptures. It was by it was by faith that Abel brought a more acceptable offering to God than Cain did. Abel's offering gave evidence that he was a righteous man, and God showed his approval of his gifts. Although Abel is long dead, he still speaks to us by his example of faith. So if we go to Genesis four, one through seven. I'll just catch you up on it real quick. Now, Adam had sexual relations with his wife, Eve, and she became pregnant. She gave birth to Cain. She said, with the Lord's help, I have produced a man. And that got me to thinking, like, did I have the Lord's help when I was making my kids? Because they're all girls. So if there's a next time, Lord, (laughs) I call on your help. (laughs) Later, she gave birth to his brother, named, named him Abel. When they grew up, Abel became a shepherd while Cain cultivated the ground. When it was time for the harvest, Cain presented some of his crops as a gift to the Lord. Abel also brought a gift, the best portions of the firstborn lamb from his flock. The Lord accepted Abel's, Abel and his gift, but he did not accept Cain and his gift. This made Cain very angry, and he looked dejected. Why are you so angry, the Lord asked Cain. Why do you look so dejected? You will be accepted if you do what is right. But if you refuse to do what is right, then watch out. Sin is crouching at your door, eager to control you. But you must subdue it and be its master. And we all know what happened with Cain and Abel, right? Anybody confused on that one? One killed the other? Okay, so... When it says it was by faith Abel brought a more acceptable offering to God than Cain, and that got me to thinking, um, if I have so like when somebody's first reading the Bible, and some people say, "Hey, start in the New Testament and then go on," and then me, my opinion, I say, "When have you ever started a book in the middle?" You know, start at the beginning because that Old Testament you wouldn't have known about Cain and Abel and what they're talking about unless you have read it before, and. Honestly, if you start in the middle in the New Testament, it'll give you more, it'll be God drawing you deeper to be like, ooh, Cain and Abel. Well, what happened there? Uh, Let me find it. Boom. Then you can just start searching around your Bible. But it got me to thinking, why was one one better than the other? Because somebody's going to ask that, you know, why is one better than the other? And it was just super simple. Um, Cain cultivated the ground. All right. And verse three, when it was time for the harvest, Cain presented... It says, some of his crops as a gift to the Lord. And what did Abel do? He brought the best portion of the firstborn lamb from his stock. One brought the best, and one just brought some. (laughs) And God was pleased with one and, like, refused the other, right? But what I like is God's mercy, even in the Old Testament. He said, what's wrong with you? Why do you look dejected? He was like, hey, bring a better one. But careful, I see where you're going. I see what I see what you're operating in, and it's crouching at your door. Be, be prepared. He gave him an option, you know? This could have went differently if he would have just listened to the Lord. Because that's where the Lord is. The Lord says, well, hey, I wasn't happy with that. But you can do better. But careful, this way leads to death. So good. The Bible's so good, guys. It just, it all points, it all points back. Okay. And then if we go to Hebrews 11, 5, it says, It was by faith that Enoch was taken up to heaven without dying. He disappeared because God took him. For before he was taken up, he was known as a person who pleased God. And if we go to Genesis five twenty one, 
It says, when Enoch was 65 years old, he became the father of Methuselah. After the birth of Methuselah, Enoch lived in close fellowship with God for another 300 years, and he had other sons and daughters. Enoch lived 365 years walking in close fellowship with God. Then one day, he disappeared because God took him. That is so, so good. Okay. It was by faith that Enoch was taken up. Okay. And I start to look at Enoch's life, right? And I start to look at the lineage ahead of it. And let's see. Adam lived to 930 years. And then Seth was 912. Enosh, 905. And then we got 910. All the words I can't pronounce, so I'm just going to say how long they lived. Uh, 910. Anyways, all of his ancestors lived about 900 years, okay? Enoch was gone at 365. And what's really cool is it says it not once, but twice, Enoch lived in close fellowship with God. Next verse. Enoch lived 365 years walking in close fellowship with God. So it got me to think, you took him really early, God. You took him at 365 years, and all of his ancestors were anywhere between seven and 900 years. And that, to me, just correlates that Enoch had, and at the time that Enoch was living, was like a very like corrupt time. Like it wasn't a really desirable time to be alive, honestly. And he walked in close fellowship with God in the early times, right? And he got taken away, just disappeared. And I think that was God's mercy on his life <laughs> because he, was, he had such a friendship with Enoch that he was like, let's go. Like, let's, let's put that flesh away. Let's go. He's like, I can't stand to be separate from you anymore. And this is just what I feel. Um, but if somebody walked in close fellowship and they said it twice, so that means you know that they're trying to hammer it home. And I was just, I don't know why I'm so stuck on Enoch, but to walk close fellowship and for God to have that mercy to be like, no, you don't have to live like all that. Because Enoch was Enoch knew Enoch understood something that everybody didn't that and he understood how to live in close fellowship with God. God, give me revelation on how to live in close fellowship with you, the way Enoch did. And I would also like to be known as a person who pleased God. And like we said before. He's pleased with you, and you're never alone. Come on. Didn't even know that was going to come up. So that's just five verses so far out of Hebrews. And if you if you just take them, take them and break them down and go back to why they're saying what they're saying, the Bible just ties everything all together. And I love this next part. I've preached like many messages on this. And it is impossible to please God without faith. Anyone who wants to come to him must believe that God exists and that he rewards those who sincerely seek him. So then I would like to challenge and say, how do you please God? And it feels like, I thought Gavin was raising his hand. I was going to be like, all right, go ahead, bud. <laughs> he was just moving his hand, though. Um, so how do you please God? I'd, I would say that if before you read this Bible verse, if you like even sat the youth kids or even an adult thing um, meeting and you said, all right, guys, we're going to talk about pleasing God. How do you please God? There'd be a lot of different answers in there, right? Because you can probably think of a million ways that you think that you can try to please God. <laughs> well, out of all of those ways, all of them are impossible unless you have faith. And that just blows my mind, too, because there's so many ways that you can think to please God, but all of them are impossible. Phew, wipe them all away. Unless you get that first thing, is that faith. Like, it seems like it's all for naught. And then, um, and then it says, the next, next, next part says, anyone who wants to come to him. Okay, and then you can ask this question, too. 
how can you come to God? And if, if you ask anybody, it says in the next part, the answer to it, <laughs> you must believe that he actually exists. Which, to me, like blows my mind a little bit because um, if you're trying to minister to somebody um, and you tell them, hey, when you wake up in the morning, just say, Jesus, I'm here, speak to me. That's not going to mean anything to them because first you have to acknowledge that he exists, that he is who he says he is. You have to acknowledge before you can, I don't know, I don't know why I'm hammering this hard, but before you can come to him, you have to acknowledge that he's real. And that's what I was talking about before, that when people actually get a revelation of Jesus, they just, get, like I've heard it time and time again, he's real, he's real, he's so real, because now they became real to him. Now they can come to him because they know what he's like. They know how to recognize him. They know how to acknowledge that he is a real person. <laughs> okay. Okay. Anyone who wants to come to him must believe that God exists and the the icing on the cake and that he rewards those. And you could stop there, right? But nope. So not only do you have to believe he exists, and then if you believe he exists, he rewards you, right? But then there's a clause there. Those who sincerely seek him. Whew. Jesus, <laughs> I come to you. You are real. And I think some versions say earnestly seek him, sincerely seek him. Jesus, help me in my time with you. Because like I was saying before, where you, you pray every day, you read your Bible every day, you set a time and a meeting with God, you set it aside, and you say, I'm going to meet with you. Okay, all of those things you're checking off, they're good. But once you're in that closet and you're in that time with him, are you sincerely seeking him? From my heart, I'm only coming to you to love you, to minister to you, to have you minister to me, not because, um, you know, a lot of ministers can fall into this trap where they only read their Bible when they're trying to put together a message. And that's just, it's, if you're in that spot, face him, <laughs> repent, look at him, say, Jesus, I've forsaken my first love. And that's what it is like to forsake your first love too. It's like when you read this Bible only to get a message, only to put together a message, only because, oh, my, you know, my women's group's coming up, so I got to read this scripture so we can talk about it. It's just like, are you sincerely seeking him? Are you getting up in the morning at six o'clock because you want to or, or because you're supposed to or it's because it's what you've been doing for years? If you start to feel complacent in that atmosphere, change your time. <laughs> change it from 6 o'clock. Do it at 8 o'clock at night. Do it at 6 o'clock at night. Change it up so that way your heart is fresh and that it's new and it's not the same. If you ever start to feel mundane when you're reading your Bible, close it and get, get into his presence. Jesus, make this word alive to me. I don't want to be going through the motions because that I know that if I sincerely seek you, you reward me. And actually what that reward is, is the revelation you get out of this book right here, because this is so good. I've gotten more rewards out of this and more life lessons than I could listening to any sermon, listening to anybody pray for me, anybody ministering to me, any worship song. I've gotten rewarded greatly by saying, Oh, here it is. Oh, wait, but it, didn't you point to this in here? Oh, well, that's a cool one. I didn't know that. What? A, wow. And then you just, it starts to change your life because it molds you like you're the clay and he's the potter. And when you come and you're saying, I'm here to only meet with you, Holy Spirit, breathe on this word and teach me. Teach me something new. And trust me, I've read Hebrews a million times and some of these revelations were just coming to me this week. All right, we're still doing a little good. Sorry if I'm rushing through this. I'm kind of looking at the clock, and I don't know if that's a good thing. All right, so in verse 7, it says, It was by faith that Noah built a large boat to save his family from the flood. He obeyed God, who warned him about these things that had never happened before. By his faith, Noah condemned the rest of the world, and he received 
the righteousness that comes by faith. Boom. And when I was reading that, we all know the the story of Noah and um, the faith that he had to have when God in the land that he was living said, there's going to be rain. Going to be what? What is that? You're going to have to build a boat. What's that? Hear me out. Like a house. But when there's just water, water, what's water? Like when it comes, you'll go, you'll be safe. But hey, people are going to hate you for it. But have faith. And what do you do? He built it. And to his family, he was like, no, God's God's right. It's coming. And when it came, doors were closed. It was good. But what I love is how they ended this. By his faith, Noah condemned the rest of the world. And right here it says, and he received the righteousness that comes by faith. So this got me to thinking. So there is a righteousness that comes by faith. What would that look like? You know what I mean? It's like, I want some of that righteousness. I don't know why that just blows my mind, the righteousness that comes by faith. And in my notes I put, there's a righteousness that comes by faith, the kind that Noah had, the kind of righteousness that Noah had. I want that. Let's see. All right, eight. It was by faith that Abraham obeyed when God called him to leave home and go to another land that God would give him as an inheritance. He went without knowing where he was going, and even when he reached the land God promised him, he lived there by faith. For he was like a foreigner living in tents, and so did Isaac and Jacob, who inherited the same promise. Abraham was confidently looking forward to a city with eternal foundations, a city designed and built by God. Okay, so he promised Abraham many sons, and many sons had father Abraham, right? And he promised him this land, and when he got to this said land, it says, kind of confusing maybe, it says that um, he lived... Let me see where it says. Without knowing and even reached promised land, he lived there by faith, for for he was like a foreigner living in tents. But isn't this the land that God promised him, right? Wouldn't, when you get there, you would just set it up and all that kind of stuff. But to me, what that is a picture of is he was looking for, like it says in the end of that, he was looking forward to a city with eternal foundations, a city designed and built by God. So he wasn't looking for this physical earth. He had God's promises, and he was in that land that God promised, and he was like a wise enough man to see, hey, I'm not going to see this fulfilled while I'm alive, but God, you are good. And I think he can start to see the pieces that God's putting together with with his sons and all that kind of stuff and how it's going to be possible but he lived in his life in such a way that even though he was in his land, he was still so focused on the eternal foundation. He wasn't so caught up on, oh, we did it, we're here, this is what God's given us. And it's just like, no, he was so heavenly minded that the earthly things didn't matter. And you guys can swim deeper on that and get some revelation on it. But like to me, on each of these were just like solid hours of just thinking about it. Okay, it was by faith that even Sarah was able to have a child. Though she was barren, was too old, she believed that God would keep his promise. And he did. And the whole nation came from this one man who was as good as dead. A nation with so many people that like the stars in the skies and the sand on the seashore, there was no way to count them. Abraham died not yet seeing that fulfilled but he still had faith for it because he what he went where God said to go. He did what God said to do because he had faith that God is the fulfiller of his word. God is the fulfiller of his promises. Okay, in 13 through 15 it says all these people oh yeah, here we go. All these people 
died still believing what God had promised them. They did not receive what was promised, but they saw it all from a distance and welcomed it. They agreed that they were foreigners and nomads here on earth. America, right? This is my home. This is my, this is my nation. This is my everything. No, heaven. This is mine. I'm just here for a little bit. I'm just visiting. I'm my my existence here is fleeting. It's like the shadow on a basketball court. Help me be in that mind frame, God, that I'm so heavenly minded that these earthly things and possessions don't matter to me. I'm a foreigner in this land, you know, like if somebody would come up to you and be like, You're a foreigner, like I'm American, I was born here. But do we have that? That's kind of like the the poor in spirit, right? I'm poor in spirit. I'm nothing without you. If you say I'm a foreigner, I am a foreigner, actually, because this is not my home right here. My home is eternal. It's with you, the marriage supper. Obviously, people who say such things are looking forward to a country they can call their own. If they had longed for the country they came from, they could have gone back. But they were looking for a better place, a heavenly homeland, That is why God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. Thank you, God, that you have prepared a city for us. And in my notes, I said all these people were longing for their home. They were lovesick, (laughs) heavenly-minded. Just to be with you, just to be so lovesick. um, And they had it. They had it way different than we have it because we have all these comfortable commodities that that keep us through on our day-to-day, our heat, our clothes, our cars, our endless supplies of food, or endless supplies of entertainment. Like, they had it different then, man. It was by faith that Abraham offered Isaac as a sacrifice when God was testing him. Abraham, who had received God's promises, was ready to sacrifice his only son, Isaac, even though God had told him, Isaac is the son through whom your descendants will be counted. Abraham reasoned, and I love Abraham's reasoning right here, because Abraham had a son, and you guys all know this story, but just for just for recap, and God told him to to sacrifice him. I mean, like, uh, that's like, okay, hold on now. You promised this. It's here. Um, now you want me to kill him. But didn't you say that he would be like the start of all of this? Okay. What does faith look like? Yes, Lord. And he had so much faith in God that this next part, Abraham reasoned that if Isaac died, God was able to bring him back to life again. And in a sense, Abraham did receive his son back from the dead. Like, come on. Like, Abraham, um, you know, there's that, you know, I was thought about it when I was a kid. And, uh, well, you know. Well, of course God was going to stop it, but really was that the case, you know? Abraham said, even if I do kill him, God will bring him back to life. Can you have your knife in your hand ready to do something the Lord told you to do? Abraham. But it's just so cool, the faith that he had. Even if my son dies, God's just, God, God made him. God birthed him. Like, he, he was a wise man because he was old. Wife was old. And they bore this miracle. But do they hold on to that miracle really closely, even though God said, hey, give it back to me? No. Open arms. Here you go. Because you've given, and you can give again. I love it. It's such a, this, like, even though I've read the Abraham story, like, it didn't, this revelation really didn't come until I, I was in Hebrews right here. And then I got to go back and read it and dive into it some more. So that's what I love about the Bible. Even though you can read it a whole bunch of times, it's still living. And like I said before, just because it's living, you have to consume it. Just because it's on the table doesn't mean you're going to eat it. You have to actually consume it. You actually give me passion to deep dig deep into this word. It was by faith that Isaac promised blessing for the future to his sons, Jacob and Esau. Okay. So when somebody's reading this part, right, um, so many times in reading Hebrews, so many times I've missed this part, okay? And as I was reading this, I'm, I'm really trying to break down every chapter and say, God, where's the meat? 
what are you saying to me this time? Because I've read this a bunch. It was by faith that Isaac promised blessing for the future to his sons, Jacob and Esau. And what's really cool is there is no mention of Jacob's deceit in this verse right here. None, not one. And it got me to thinking, this is the New Testament. Grace covers all. Like, he, 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 he very well could have said, it was by faith that Isaac promised blessings to the future, to his sons, Jacob and Esau, even though one, you know, even though Jacob was deceitful, and, you know, they could have, like, re-brought that back up again to remind you, but that's not what God wanted right here, because his, his, his grace covers all of that. So that's just where my revelation in that, like, this one little verse made me go, wow, your grace even in here, your grace, and something as small as that, you know? All right, it was by faith that Jacob, when he was old and dying, blessed each of Joseph's sons and bowed in worship as he leaned on his staff. Okay, and then when I was reading this, I was like, what are you talking about? Because I've read that before, and it's in Genesis 48. And I was going to go into reading it, but um, basically it's, uh, I think, Manasseh. Let's see. All right. I'll just read it. Then he positioned the boys in front of Jacob. With his right hand, he directed Ephraim toward Jacob's left hand. And with his left hand, he put Manasseh at Jacob's right hand. But Jacob crossed his arms as he reached out to lay his hands on the boy's head. He put his right hand on the head of Ephraim, though he was the younger boy, and his left hand on the head of Manasseh, though he was the firstborn. Then he blessed Joseph and said, May the God before whom my grandfather Abraham and my father Isaac walked, the God who has been my shepherd all my life to this very day, the angel who has redeemed me from all harm, may he bless these boys, may they preserve my name, and the names of Abraham and Isaac, and may their descendants multiply greatly throughout the earth. But Joseph was upset when he saw that his father placed his right hand on Ephraim's head. So Joseph lifted it to move it from Ephraim's head to Manasseh's head. No, my father, he said, this one is the firstborn, because his eyesight was was struggling at that point, right? And um, he said, put your right hand on his head. But his father refused, he said, I know, my son, I know. He replied, Manasseh will also become a great people, but his younger brother will become even greater, and his descendants will become like a multitude of nations. So for me, that little verse and me going back and reading why, what does that have to do? It was by faith that Jacob, when he was old and dying, blessed each of Joseph's sons, and bowed in worship as he leaned onto his staff. And to me, I was like, what does that mean then? Like, I mean, he don't, I'm, so the, the transition of faith there, even though he was, his eyesight was failing, he was hearing from the Lord. And the Lord said, no, the younger one, right hand. And he went like that. By faith, he leaned forward and listened to the Lord because he knew that this younger one would be great. You will be great, but he will also be great. So, like, that's a really good... He had faith eyes when he was going to lay that blessing. You know, he didn't just do what's normal, old, young. No, even in something like that, he heard from the Lord, and he crossed him up, and he laid him down. I don't know why that and just... All of these just blow me away, guys. I'm just... So they're so so rich in this Hebrew elevens. If you if you like if you know your Bible, it makes complete sense. And if you dig deeper, it'll make even more sense. So that's all of the Hebrews I had right there. So with all of that, if somebody is going, if somebody's going through a trial. If somebody's going through a trial and gets attacked, does that mean that they have less faith than somebody who isn't going through a trial? Like if somebody's going through a trial and they're just getting beat up and beat up, you know, like if somebody's going to like, well, I'm not going through that. Why am I not going through that? I must have more faith. 
and that's not true at all. And that's kind of a way that I thought um, at some point down my life until God corrected it. And it was um, this the same faith that keeps somebody out of a trial is the same faith that leads somebody through the trial. So just because you're going through a trial right now does not mean you don't have faith, okay? If you're going through a trial right now, your faith, bolster your faith, attach it to it, because that same faith is what's going to see you through to the other side of this trial. And then after this trial, your faith is going to be, it's going to be bolstered. It's going to, you, you've went through this trial with God. So like, it's weird to say, but don't waste your trial. You know what I mean? What is God, what is God going to teach you from this trial? <laughs> And also the same faith that that protects somebody from death is the <laughs> let me make sure I say this right. So the same faith that delivers somebody from death is the same faith that enables them to die victoriously. Wrap your head around that one. And also faith is faith is not faith is not a bridge over troubled waters, okay? Because these troubled waters are your trials, right? And faith is not the bridge that gets you over it. Faith is the pathway that gets you through it. So if you're going through a trial, let's bolster your faith who's the king of kings and the Lord of lords and the lover of your soul, who is the only one that can help you through it, who is the only one that can see it through to completion. And then also to the effect of when I was saying that the same faith that gives you victory in death, right? And in your faith also, your faith like Abraham, it affects generations. Because of Abraham's faith, generations, right? And his faith, his, his kids saw that, right? I want my kids to see that faith. I want to teach them when they're young that this is where your faith rests. Any trials that you have, have faith. God is who he says he is, that his word is true, that it does not come back void. And I think, like I said, um, I had this revelation that um, health is only a crown that the sick people see. So when I was sick and I thought I was dying there for two weeks, I would look around at all these people that were smiling and they were happy and you know, or some of my subs that were getting done with a uh, a job, and you know, bye Jesse, have a good time. And they, you know, I was like, well, what are you gonna do? Oh, I'm gonna go watch some football, you know, do whatever. And then in my head, I'm like, man, they got peace in their life, they got health. Because you know, at this point, I thought I was dying, right? Like, oh, your time's limited, you know. But for some people, their time is uh, becoming limited on Earth, and that's something that that healthy people take for granted is that that crown of health that they wear that they don't even recognize because if your foot hurts tomorrow right you like say you break your big toe you're gonna look at everybody else walking around and you're gonna be like must be nice all the while that you forgot that you were walking good for 30 years you will forget what it feels like to be walking good right so just you know, and we all know people that are going through trials, and some of us are going through trials, and I would be safe to say that all of us are going through trials of some sort. They're just different trials. Some are bigger trials. Some are smaller trials. And God's getting you to to exercise your faith, to practice it. Is he who he says he is? Does he do what he says he does? And then that worship song, All My Life, He Has Been Faithful, just makes me weep. All my life. And actually, what's really cool is when we come to repentance, 
we give God a chance to be faithful. Ugh. All my life you've been faithful. Your mercies are new every morning. So if somebody is living in sin right now, and I'm speaking to you guys, if somebody is living in something that they know that they shouldn't be doing, you get a, you get a chance to let God be faithful to you, to let God look at you and shine upon you and give you favor, right? I just love that. Faith isn't a bridge over troubled waters. It is, a, it is a pathway through it. And if you think about Moses in the Red Sea, right? God, give me a bridge. No. On through. Okay. I'm going to wrap it up. Jesus. Jesus, thank you. Thank you, Jesus, that you're enough. Jesus, we worship you. You want to put some some tunes on there, Mr. Nate? Jesus, we worship you. You're so beautiful. We thank you for your spirit. We thank you for your Holy Spirit. God, I ask you to speak to our hearts right now. God, I ask you to... to <laughs> we're, going to we're going to need a bolstering of faith in this church family for what is to come. And I only read like a, a little bit of uh, Chad Getz's thing, but it was so spot on to what's happening. Jesus, I ask you to prepare our hearts. I ask you to prepare our hearts for what's to come, God. 